Think Tri Cities. It is Thursday at nine o'clock, so it's time for coffee with Carl. I'm Carl Dye from Tridec, and we've got a great uh, panel and discussion point today. We're today we're going to talk about vitrification and what's coming up uh, at the VIT plant. We are honored to have Tom Fletcher, who's uh, the Federal Project Director for Waste Treatment Plant and DF Law Program Manager. Good morning, Tom. Good morning, Carl. I had to make sure I got your title right. It's kind of got a lot of parts to it. <laughs> That's a true this. statement. You bet. And oh. also uh, Val McCain from Vectal. She's the project director for the VIP plan. Good morning, Val. Good morning, Carl. Thanks both you guys for joining us. I, um, you know, I've been here, gosh, almost uh, 18 months now. And of course with COVID, everything's been shut down, but I can't wait to, to get a, an actual tour with the VIP plant. And obviously there's some great milestones coming up. Looking forward to, to being out there and, and really hitting some of these uh, the, some of these dates and deliverables that you guys have been working so hard on. So thanks for joining us. It's gonna be a great discussion this morning. Uh, our first point of order is we talk about coffee mugs or coffee, start off with coffee story. So I'm gonna uh, start off with a plug for uh, Port of Benton. Port of Benton's a great partner of ours, one of the three ports that uh, that Tridec works with, and we have representation on our board. Uh, you know, they're just a great group of people um, to work with. They have great projects. They also host the Tri Cities Research District. Um, that that there's there's a lot of great, especially energy related projects that are coming down and research and advanced manufacturing. Port of Benton's a great partner for ours, so I'm giving them a plug with the mug this morning. Let's go to Let's go to Val next. Val, what do you got for a mug or coffee story for us? All right. So coffee story, and it is filled with coffee. So I'm going to be careful. Uh, this is my <laughs> daily mug. It says it's all good. I picked this up probably five years or so ago, and I liked, I liked it. It resonated with me. Um, some people say I'm a bit of an optimist. And I think that uh, this has a little bit of a calming influence. Tom and I deal with a lot of challenges all day long. And it's a little reminder not to you know, not to sweat too many things, you know, and um, kind of keep things in perspective. Uh, but so I like the mug and it's, it's a good saying. It does have a companion mug though with it. And I'm gonna share that one real quick. And that's make it happen. And the thing of it is, is we do have a lot of challenges. We wanna stay calm, but we need to get stuff done. And um, that happens to be the top rung of the ladder of accountability. So I really like that. It's one of my favorite tools and uh, so we're happy to be here today and, and share what we're doing to help make it happen out at the VIT plant. That's great. I, you know, being in economic development, like optimism and blue sky is what we deal with in every day. So I really appreciate that. <laughs> Tom, how about you? What do you got for a mug or a coffee story for us? So I too have coffee filled mug um, and I have a blue wood mug. Uh, my family is, my wife and two kids are outdoor enthusiasts. We spend most of our time uh, when I'm not at work. Uh, and the balance of work life is an important step to me outside in the environment. Uh, in the winter, we're on the mountains. And in the summer, we're in either in our boat or in the, out hiking. Um, so for me, uh, the remembrance of making sure that while we do a lot, of, uh, a lot of cool things here at the office and it's challenging to get there, don't get tied up in in just the work side, it's important to integrate that work and life um, because uh, each of us have a portion of that, whether it's personal or um, like family related or just individually related, it's important to have that balance. So that's why I keep, uh, keep a reminder of that balance with me at all times. That's a great point. I, I'll just say, you know, being new to the Tri-Cities, that's what's so great about being is your, you know, any outdoor activity you want to do, you're right in the middle. You know, you may have to travel away like, like to Bluewood or different places to do it, but you've got so many different opportunities, you know, but I mean, the coast isn't that far away. Obviously the mountains are close and that's, that's a great point. Okay. Uh, well, let's get into it. I, I know you guys have some slides that we'll go through and talk about some key points in uh, basically the whole waste process, waste, waste treatment, and then the vitrification plant. So let's go ahead and start those slides. And I believe Tom, we're going to start with you on the first slide. So take it away. Yeah, Val and I'll tag team this throughout this process. So what we prepared today is a journey to melt their heat up. And this is really our near-term focus as we move into the next couple years or next year. So if you can go to uh, slide two, what I want to start with was kind of the history a little bit. Uh, on the Hanford site is 177 underground tanks currently storing 56, roughly 56 million gallons 
of tank waste that was uh, placed in those tanks during the production of plutonium for the safeguards of our nation. Um, what our job today is, is to retrieve that tank waste and put it in a form that's protective of human health and the environment. Um, one of the, some of the challenges that we have with this is unlike some of the, our sister sites, Savannah River, uh, we were the, we were the, the beginning of tank, to, of uh, dissolution. So there are five processes that took place that really lead to that, that complexity, the complexity of the radioactive waste that we have in our tank farms. Um, and the, and the challenges that we then have to manage as we move from storing to treating, which is where we're headed. Uh, we've been in a posture of storing that waste. Now we're moving to treating that waste. And as we go to the treatment, we're using proven technology from over the, over the pond, as I should say, over in Sellafield in England. Um, uh, France has it as well as locally with defense, uh, process waste facility at Savannah river, our sister site that took our final process Purex and used it at their site. So uh, going down this path is, is very, we're using proving technology, but the scale of technology, as you're gonna see in the coming slides is very different um, from a Hanford's perspective. So if we can go to slide three. We'll talk a little bit about uh, direct feed low activity waste. And this is the first step of that treatment process. Um, direct feed low activity waste Originally, I think everybody knows that there was, the plan was to run both direct feed and high level waste simultaneously. Uh, there were some technical challenges with the high level waste side of the house or so the decision made in 2013 to really focus on uh, getting that most mobile fraction, which is our super innate fraction, our low activity waste um, started. So we put together what's called the direct feed low activity waste program. And what's unique about this is it requires both site offices, Richland Operations Office, as well as the Office of River Protection, and all five of our prime contractors um, to work in tandem and in conjunction to truly make this happen. Um, and we'll really get the, the feel for this as we go through this presentation um, for what that really means. Because as you can see, there's representation from all those major contractors um, in, this, in this picture. And, the waste feed, uh, low activity waste, and I say program, and I say program for a reason, because it's a collection of individual projects, infrastructure activities, and truly fundamental programs that lay as the foundation to allow us to treat this waste in the coming uh, years. Um, we are on track and moving towards that milestone of treating waste prior to December of 23, which is currently the consent decree milestone. Uh, we do have some some uh, impacts, or we had some impacts from COVID, but it is our goal to still uh, do everything we can to make that milestone. Um, and, and, what I, and I think this is, this is a, a poster child of communication, collaboration, um, and, and really focusing on the big picture, uh, the, the Hanford mission as a whole, and, and the team has done an amazing job of coming together. Uh, we have regular meetings with senior leaders, both on the DOE side and contractor side jointly for, for DF law and ensure we're staying focused on delivering that mission um, because any one component that breaks down breaks the whole system. Um, so major effort going into that process. If we can slide on to slide four, I'll give you a little bit of brief intro before I turn over to Val on where we're headed. Um, and it's really the start of, of the culture shift. Um, Tom, I had a question on that. I was going to ask. Um, Go ahead. You talked about like the, the contractor meetings that you guys have with top management, and and uh, you know just here in the last year we've had CPC Co and HMIS transfer those those contracts. And I know uh, when we've had Brian Vance on before, he's talked about uh, you know the, kind of what you're you're aiming at here. I think that you know we're going from a construction phase into eventually getting to an operations phase, and so. Uh, what's kind of the status of maybe uh, when that contract will be let or like the RFP process for the operations side of, of the, the whole process? Yeah, I can give you a, give you a kind of a general status. Um, the integrated tank disposal contract includes the follow on scope for the operations of the waste treatment plant. It is currently out on the streets in a draft RFP format. Um, we expect in the not too distant future. We don't have a specific date because of course that uh, that is, it, it's always evolving, I'll just say, sure. um, but it is not too distant future that the actual RFP will come out and then that will follow the standard process that all those other contracts that you just mentioned, uh, CPC Co as well as the HMIS contract, 
um, have followed uh, to go through the release process. Um, and once that contract is in place and we have, we as uh, the VIT plant side of the house has demonstrated successful hot commissioning at that point in time would be that point in which that future contract will pick up the operations of the waste treatment plant. I got it. Thanks. Yeah, so, so what I wanted to get just briefly touch on and Val will elaborate on this is really, we've been in a, in a culture that's been driven by construction. It's been driven by creating the physical plant. And that's kind of represented in that middle box. But what's in, equally as important is that you have to have, and, and construction is all about the physical asset. Um, but as we move towards hot commissioning, you have to have the people that are gonna operate that plant, the paper that's gonna support them operating the plant in a safe and effective manner. And then the plant itself to, to not only be constructed as intended, but to operate as intended. Um, so what I'll do now is I'll transition to Val as she goes into more depth in each of these sections um, and really uh, shows you where we're headed at in the coming couple months and into the next years. Great. Val? Thanks Tom. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, I think this slide is sort of um, indicative of the transformation that we're having out at the VIT plant. And so for uh, the audience out there that has been either involved with the VIT plant firsthand, some of our alumni, uh, some of our supporters, whether it's PNNL or others um, in the community that are part of the project, we have, as Tom has said, you know, been in that middle thing, the plant, and really focused in on on the construction, the design and the construction of the plant for so long. And now you will hear a shift as we, as we make our presentations and, and within our own project and how we talk about things about the three Ps. So that's how you can remember it, three Ps, people always first and then plant and paper. And so we'll, we'll jump into those. If we can go to the next slide on there and talk about the people aspect um, a little bit. Uh, we have had a shift this you know we're building our team for operations and and this has been ongoing i would say for the last two two years or so and uh, really making that transition of starting to build up that permanent plant uh, uh, team which is uh, commissioning techs you would have heard us talk about the commissioning techs in the past they are the ones that will be operating the plant uh, they come out of our um, um, local um, IBEW, and uh, we have about 140 on board right now, and they are going through all their various uh, phases of training on the project in order to be prepared to start up the plant. Um, earlier this year, we brought in our lab techs. Uh, we have 24 lab techs. We brought them in in two groups, uh, two groups of 12, I think January, and then again in, in April timeframe. And they're going through their training. Uh, very exciting to see them in the laboratory, the brand new laboratory and, and working and learning the instrumentation. They joined up with seven chemists that we had already had on board since around 18, uh, 2019 timeframe. They were working in an offsite laboratory in partnership with CBC while we were getting the laboratory ready. So we were able to work things in parallel so that laboratory team is coming together. And then we've recently started, I think it was the end of May, uh, started our first set of uh, rad techs that we brought on board. And they're in uh, the midst of uh, beginning their training as well. So I think that the team relative to the training programs, obviously they're very robust training programs and it's both classroom training, that's where they all start in classroom training, but they'll do on the job training, they have simulator training, there's drills and other uh, quals training. So uh, all of the, the individuals that I just talked about on our team are in those various phases right now of their training programs. And so uh, we just, it's an exciting time to, to see the growth in, in the transition of, of the workforce um, to the, the ones that'll be operating the VIP plant. And Val, it looks like uh, I see the logo uh, there are the building and, and construction trade union, but uh, I mean, I'm, and I know a little bit, uh, you know, inside baseball, but it seems like you guys have a great partnership and they've been, you know, really aligned with this project. Can you talk a little bit about that? I think, you know, it's skilled labor and is such a really an asset that we have here in the Tri-Cities. We're seeing it on some of the advanced reactor companies that we're bringing in, you know, and 
And it's amazing to me that that some of those skilled trades, you know, it's not just like a cleanup or a construction or an operation phase, but then it also, you know, moves over into uh, new uh, nuclear. So it's a it's a real strength for us. But can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I know. Exactly. We have a really good partnership with with the building trades and uh, Nick Bumpus and the team that um, are leading those efforts. And they've, they've been with us, you know, for a long time. And I, I really, um, a shout out to the building trades, because when you think of the VIT plant history to date, you know, 20 years of, of what's been built out at the site, um, they're part of it. And, and part of um, just the, the safe quality work that's been done, a tremendous job. And now we're seeing the shift as we, as naturally with construction being completed and, and those tradesmen and women are you know, shifting off to other work that they can go to in the community. Uh, we've built up all the individuals I just talked about, rad techs coming from the laborers union, uh, lab techs coming from the pipe fitters. And so it's uh, a continuing relationship now into this different phase. And so uh, we're excited about that and just really pleased with um, how we're able to work together to advance the mission out here. That's great, thank you. All right, if we can go to the next slide on the plant, which is you know what we've been talking about a lot for many years is is um, building the facilities to operate DF law. Uh, the pictures that you see here represent the key facilities. They are all construction completed. Uh, the low activity waste facility, which is really the heart of the plant process, our analytical lab, there's 14 balance of facilities or there's support facilities. The picture there is of the um, glass former facility and then our effluent management facility, which was the last one that was completed and part of uh, the DF law approach. So sort of the last one to enter into uh, to start of construction out at the VIT plant. So construction completed, huge milestone. We celebrated that at the beginning of the year. And now where we're at is once you construct, you, you go through the startup testing of the different systems and components in the plant. That's been ongoing through the construction process as things have completed. Right now, we're down to the last bits in the low activity waste or the law facility relative to the startup activities and plan to finish that up over the next couple of months. Uh, so very exciting because what happens as each time that we, we complete those activities in the uh, systems or facilities, that gets handed over to our plant management team and then they can start doing some of their testing, integrated testing and start prepping for, for hot commissioning. And so I think we've got a couple more pictures on the next slide as well. Um, I know some of the audience um, may have been out at the VIT plant uh, before, but probably not recently. So uh, these pictures might uh, be new to you to see some of the work going on relative to the container testing that you can see. This is, I think we're right here, we're down in the lowest level of the law facility. And uh, the, the startup team there is doing uh, testing on the containers that will uh, hold the vitrified waste. And then you can see the finishing line and some of the remote testing uh, equipment. But I think you know, it would be really great if we're able to get you inside the plant. And so I'm wondering if we can go do a little bit of a virtual tour and maybe check out some of the law facility. I, maybe before we jump into that, Val, I had one question for you on sure. um, like COVID. And I know I get your guys' emails on when you hit milestones and, and you know, on the, the construction schedule, but how did you guys work with COVID? I mean, were, were you able to, obviously there was, I think a short period where people couldn't physically be on site, but then um, obviously uh, dates had to change because of the pandemic, but um, can you share any, uh, you know, how to go and, and, you know, are you back to fully open as far as uh, the work that you're doing or how's, how's COVID affecting your, your plan and your operations? Yeah, great, great question. I mean, COVID for everybody, you know, it's just unprecedented challenge, uh, certainly for us out, out at Hanford. And I'll say the collect, I'll speak for the collective Hanford here, not just the VIT plant. I think that 
one of the, it did impact us and, and probably everybody a little bit differently out here for us, those startup activities that I was just talking about within law and, and even the remainder of construction, that was the critical path and still is the critical path of the project. So when you can't have people physically out working critical path, it doesn't matter so much all the other stuff that you're able to get done. You're not advancing sure. the schedule the way you'd like to. So we'll work through that. Uh, the team, though, did a tremendous job of just pivoting and then figuring out, well, what can we advance? If we can't advance the physical work, what can we do? So we talked a lot about, uh, well, we're going to talk in the next little bit about paper. I'll talk about the paper that we advanced during that time. And, and then as we were able to start bringing people back, we, we did smart things that were really allowed us to advance the mission, but protect the health and safety of the workforce, which is number one. So we did some outdoor work and did some of the paving. So you get out to site, you would see just, it looks like a, a finished plant, uh, fencing up, paving mm. done. And so we did smart things like that where we could advance, but it was in a safe manner. The other thing is that we did go, um, as many people did during this time to maximum teleworking. And we're still in that mode. So we've, we've brought some people back uh, that need to be back to physically support the work on the ground. But many of our people are still teleworking and doing that very effectively. And I, I could see that as something that we're talking about um, continuing and figuring out how do we, some positions might be able to do that long-term, others might be a hybrid approach. So some good things um, from that perspective came out. And, and Tom, maybe you have some you'd like to add? Yeah. yeah, and I would say on the departmental side, we see uh, benefit from a hybrid model as well. Um, clearly, we've shown that uh, telework is something that we can do effectively. Um, there is some limitations because we are in the field doing an oversight model, but for the most part, there's some level of telework that can go on um, across our organizations. And I suspect as we look to the future, um, while I don't know the, the percentage, the telework will become a part of our future uh, new normal. Um, clearly, clearly COVID has created an opportunity for us to see new advantages in, in that new normal, um, while it has also created challenges that we had to overcome during it. Yeah, definitely. I know, you know, from our team, which obviously we're a lot smaller than you guys, but uh, we found that we were able to use technology, even things like Microsoft Teams, right, that you can kind of have this chat function, you can literally check in with people all the time. And, and I think it's, it's interesting. I remember a long time ago in college, you know, like in a management or HR class and this whole thing about productivity and even, you know, time and motion studies, right? Back in kind of like after the industrial revolution and that whole concept of like, you have to be in the office so somebody can watch you to get stuff done. I think we've all learned collectively that there's ways to overcome that and come up with, like say hybrid in some different ways to be effective and be productive too, so. Great, great insights. I appreciate you guys sharing that. Let's let's start the virtual tour. Okay, this, oh, this is great. We can take you inside a little bit. I think there's probably then uh, two, two spots I'd like to go inside the low activity waste facility. Again, this is the heart of the VIT plant process where our melters are. So uh, control room, here we are in the control room. And uh, this is where it all happens, the remote operation of, of the equipment that we're going to be looking at in um, in our next stop, and you know here we have some of our commissioning techs and the supervisors uh, that are in there, and their job is to continually monitor the systems within the plant, and that's happening already. Uh, even though we don't ha haven't started up the plant from the vitrification standpoint, our utility systems are started and running, and so we are already working within this control room. And it's been um, now well over a year, I guess, coming up on two years that we've had the control room open. So um, great to see to to see that in, in the activity here. Tom, anything you want to add about control room before we go down to the basement? I think you covered it well. I think the key here is, is that all of our operations are remote from a day-to-day -day operation, but our, our, ma our maintenance of the facility is contact handled. So we'll, we'll manage this with a hands-on, unlike the high-level waste side of the house where the maintenance is remote, remote capability. So just some slight nuances, but, but amazing to see the team in action here in, in the facility. I think I might throw in just, you know, seeing this picture and, and the monitoring and the remote, um, you know, operations capability reminds me of, 
going through a food processing plant with modern technology, right? Or a sawmill or, and I think that's maybe kind of the analogy that, that with today's technology, you know, things like programmable logic controllers and other sensors and stuff, you, you don't have to have a whole big room full of steam gauges and stuff like that. You can have what, you know, obviously some monitors and some equipment to do the remote monitoring. And, and it's, it, although obviously you guys have a different level of, certification and training and everything else, the analogy to other, you know, production manufacturing um, operations uh, procedures is it, I mean, that's kind of what I think about when I see this picture. Yeah, no, that's true. And I'll point out something else as well, Carl, just because you asked about COVID, it's a little difficult to see here, but between these monitors uh, for the individual watch stations, there's uh, plastic, the plexiguard screens. And then of course you see uh, face coverings on on our commissioning tech. So it's just, you know, everybody's adapted and and figured out how to move on. So, but I just, they're difficult to see, but I wanted to point that out is that's one of the things we needed to get in place pretty quickly because, um, you know, our commissioning techs were, were some of the key ones that stayed on board during the um, beginning of COVID and, and throughout. Yeah. Okay. All right, let's go down into um, the basement of law. I call it the basement, uh, the lowest level. Uh, it's where our poor caves are. And this is where the vitrified waste is contained and also transferred out for storage. Uh, so once the, once the waste is, um, is mixed and heated in the melters, it's then poured into containers. And I, I don't know if we'll see them in here, but we saw them in the one picture and then yeah. transferred um, by mechanical handling system. And so um, let's see if we can go to the right. Okay, we can see a, one of the robots here. Okay, and this is used in the mechanical handling process. And so when I've also talked about the testing that's been ongoing, it's testing all of this equipment and the systems and components to make sure it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. It's doing it from the control room when, when commands are made and um, that everything's working as planned. So you can tell that just by looking at the picture, there's a lot of work to be done, 94 systems, uh, but with many aspects to those within the law facility. So Tom, do you want to um, mention anything down here? We can go down the finishing line and actually look in the poor caves as well. No, I don't have anything in addition to this one, Val. You did a good job. Thank you. Okay. Well, I, got a, I got a question for you, Val. Is like that robot, for instance, um, you know, just looking at the side of it and some of the control features and then maybe the monitoring that coming off of it, you know, is that something that you buy off the shelf that, that you can, or is it that you buy components and then engineer it to adapt to the situation? Because obviously this is a one of a kind, complete complex. And Correct. as far as I know, everything's got to be kind of scratch built, engineered, and then built. It's not like you know, you're just going through the catalog and picking something off the shelf and putting it together, right? Like it's, it's way more complicated than that. That's correct. And I think that's, you know, one of the, it's, it's sometimes when we talk in these presentations and we kind of say, oh, 94 systems and we're almost done, it sounds kind of easy. And, um, and you might say, and it's, it's all good. You know, <laughs> there's a lot of challenges and there are a lot of complexities and our engineering and design teams and then the construction teams uh, going through to um, and procurement team for that matter, working with our suppliers and vendors to um, build um, the the robots and the other you know a lot of custom um, specialty equipment is that is the name of the game in here. Um, uh, very little of this kind of stuff is you know off the shelf. Tom, anything to add on that? No, I think I think the the biggest thing for the people to remember is that this is a one of a kind facility. Um, there is no there is no match to it anywhere in the world. So as we design and engineer construct, while there may be some commercial off the shelf components, and how they operate as a whole is one of a kind. So that's the challenges that we are facing as a system, as a system by system today, and then as we move into commissioning, which we'll talk a little bit in the coming slides, into an integrated fashion in the future. Thanks. This is a picture of the poor caves here, and it's a little bit difficult to see, but there's those are turntables in there and there's three of them and the containers will be placed in there. And then uh, the melter above, it's just where it's going to be pouring in uh, the, the vitrified waste into the containers and then out through there, it's going to be lifted out 
and then put on, I think we have a picture where you can see the, a, a bogey cart or at least see the finishing line where it'll go on a, like a little a rail track um, down to um, where it's cooled off before it's um, taken, taken off site. Now we can see it's making its way there down the finishing line. All right, does it go any further than that? Or maybe that's the last, the last bit. Okay, I think that's what I will show you within there, just so if we have more time um, and we can go back in, um, we can maybe look at another area of the plant. And, um, but before we leave there, just one more time to Tom, if there's anything you wanna pick up on the, pro we're gonna hit the process a little bit of where we're headed in future slides. So, um, but this, this gives you a, a sense of how things look uh, today. I think these pictures in here are, are fairly current. Well, the only thing that I would add is I would encourage, I think uh, Tracy put the link out on the, in the actual chat. So I'd encourage you to go look at the site yourself. You're able to do either a guided tour or just kind of mill around. And it's a good opportunity to see relatively up-to-date pictures of not just WTP, but the entirety of Hanford site. Yeah, well, that's, that's a great recommendation. That's... Well, Val, yeah. I was just going to say like, like there was the, um, uh, had the turntables in the caves. I forget what you call yeah, them, but basically cave. the, yeah, the, the vitrified glass and waste will come in from the top, go into the container and then kind of move out into that hallway and then be moved down as maybe it's already cool or something, but then the robot handles it and takes it to the next stage. Is that kind of like what we're looking at? The one uh, Correct. down in the basement? Yeah. It'll get moved down there and then, yeah, and cooled down, uh, you know, go down that finishing line and cooled um okay. yeah that's correct so that's gotcha. kind of the end of the process relative to the the vitrifying of the waste um in the in the law facility okay thank you so of the three p's we're on paper and so this is uh as tom mentioned you know there's uh we've got to make sure that the procedures are in place and the various plans that we're going, that we're following, and it will adhere to as far as uh, operating the plant. Uh, so there's, it's ensuring that we have our documentation, procedures, programs, and controls in place uh, that'll be needed by our people. So it includes things like with our procedures, and, and you may have seen we put out a, a share on this a few months back, you know, 5,500 procedures, step-by-step -step procedures um, completed by the team. And uh, we also have, you know, our safety management programs, commissioning programs, and, and several of our key documents that are needed to start up the plant that require DOE approval are in place. They've been approved and in place. And I think another aspect of this I wanted to point out is that paper also includes our permitting. And so we're in good shape relative to the permits um, still remaining and certifications remaining from uh, Washington Department of Ecology and Health and uh, working well together with them in order to make sure that we're able to um, get the plant online um, as soon as possible. And so I think, you know, from my perspective, we've made a lot of progress at the VIT plant over the years but there's still a lot to go. And so when I talk about DF law and that approach, I'll typically right now, we're, we're just a tad over 90% complete, uh, but the last 10% is gonna be a climb. And I think that's just a good segue um, to pass over to, to Tom to talk about the next steps. I had a quick question for you, Val. Um, you talked about some of the, the jobs that you're bringing on like the rad techs and, and some of the laboratory Texas and stuff like that. Can you talk a little bit about the culture? You know, you guys have obviously been focused on um, construction, but now along with the different positions that you're hiring for and training and then integrating into the paper and the procedure and stuff, how does culture shift or how does culture change and how do you guys, how do you work on it? How do you address it? Yeah, I th it's a great question. I'm going to actually ask if we can hold that one until maybe okay. we get through what Tom, because I think some of that might come up in some of that discussion in gotcha. there, and then we'll we'll kind of layer in as um, as we go, because that is the name of the game right now is getting that maturing of the, the operational culture out at site. So, Tom? Yeah, so if we can go to slide nine. 
So one of the things that uh, Val and I have have racked our brain and then we came up with the best analogy we could think of was where we've been and where we're going. Um, and what, what we thought was probably, and, and Val talked a little bit about this, we're 90% done. And, and really when we look at a distance of from the California coast to the highest point in the contiguous USA, which is Mount Whitney, we've made it from the coast to the, to the basically the trailhead to start the climb. Mm. But what's in front of us is a 4,000 foot climb in a little less than four miles. Um, and that remaining climb is, is the real challenge. Um, the other one is just purely pushing through to get to the end. And, and what we're trying to depict in this picture is really that climb is when we move into that integrated operations, um, not to discredit the work that was done because the work that was done was done by a phenomenal team um, that truly got us to where we are. But we as a team collectively, um, we were able to do that kind of an isolation, not within DF law. Now we're in an integrated fashion where we have to all come together and we can't reach that climb without doing it as a team. Um, the, and I, I say that, I mean the entire DF law team. So as you look to this graph, we're really depicting that last 10% and, and that climb. And as you sit back and look at trying to plan your route, uh, you might put a, a route on a piece of paper that makes complete sense. But as you start that climb, uh, you, you get a, a worker or you get a teammate that's got a challenge and you have to take a second route or a, a detour. And what we're trying to really show with our team is that while we have a plan, we as a team have got to be flexible. We've got to be resilient. We've got to work as a team to get to the top. We can't achieve success of operations, which is at the top of this mountain, without, not, without all of us working together. Um, so when you look at this from a timeline, where we are right now is we're just shy of loss of power test. That loss of power test really is the initiating event for the, the sequencing to get to that operation. It is the first point where we do an integrated test, and this is specific to WTP, but really has a joint piece, but an integrated test that says, if we lose power, how does our teammate put the facility in a safe condition? And how do we bring it back from that condition um, once it is? Because one of the unique things about this uh, this plant and all and all uh, vitrification plants is the melter is just like an induction oven or just like an induction cooktop. The glass is the element. So the glass becomes the element. If the glass re gets hard or loses the ability to put the current through it, therefore you have a large block of glass, 300 ton piece of paperweight. Um, and none of us can afford a 300 ton paperweight. Um, in, in this process. So that first step, which says, can our operators and our team react to that loss of power and can we bring it back? And that includes our site power. So can our HMIS counterparts help us bring that back? This one will be a simulated drill where it's just within the WTP side of the house, but in the future we'll have to run those operational drills where we are actually simulating the entire picture. Um, but that's that first step. You then go into a phase where we're looking at water runs. We're making sure the water moves through the plant. We can operate the facility. And then we really get to the point, and Melter 1 heat up is that major target that we're heading towards this year, this calendar year. Um, and that really is a point of no return. Um, at that point in time, this plant remains hot 365 days, 24 hours, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Um, you can't turn off a Melter. There's no such thing like I just talked about. So uh, we, will, we will start that process. Right now, the, the target is to start that process this calendar year of Melter Heat Up. It's about a two month evolution. I'll talk a little bit about more of that on the next slide. Um, and once that evolution is done, we'll then go through some validation. Everything's good to go. And we'll then start into our cold commissioning phase, which is really using chemical simulants um, to simulate real waste, put our Put all those 5,500 procedures that Val talked about through process and validation, making sure they work for us. Um, once we have done that initial cold commissioning, we'll fire up the second melter. This is really a risk reduction. Originally, we had both melters filing up simultaneously. But as Val and I looked, to, looked at this plan, um, making sure that we learn off, le off the melter one before we go into melter two heat up was a major component that we changed here in the last couple of years. Um, and really credit to our team for looking hard at making sure and mitigating risk. And that's a major risk to us. Should we have a challenge in Melter 1, we surely don't want to have challenge in two Melter simultaneously. So we get to learn for about six months, seven months before we heat Melter 2 up. 
We'll go through some significant, which isn't shown on here, but one of the significant tasks between Melter 2 heat up and hot commissioning is our environmental performance demonstration tests, what we call EDPT tests. And that really shows that the system is operating in accordance with our license, our, our permits, both from an air standpoint and a glass standpoint um, to validate those, as well as we'll validate that our system is meeting our performance standards from a throughput, through a capacity, uh, and that's in an integrated fashion. That's not just for WTP, that's for the entirety of the system um, from a EMF, not, I mean, not just the law facility, that's the entirety of the DF law system. And then finally, we'll go into hot commissioning, which is our first real entry of rad waste coming from the tank farms. Um, that's the initiating operation step. We'll do that for a, an extended period of time to ensure that the facility is operational and acting and behaving as we expected. And then we ultimately reach the top of the mountain with operations and that transition to, uh, at that point in time, that transition we talked earlier to that new contract that ultimately will take that for the long, the long road. Um, we are on track um, to move towards uh, or to achieve hot commissioning and be operational in 2023. Um, I, I, I would tell you while we have spring on this chart, we Val and I have a lot of risk to manage between now and then to ensure spring happens and clearly spring could become summer. Um, but both Val and I are dedicated and, and committed to making 23 happen. Uh, and it's just not Val and I, I shouldn't say it that way. The team, um, it is a collective effort. The DF Law leadership team uh, comprised of all of the assistant managers um, and all the contractor presidents and COOs um, is truly dedicated to make that happen, supported by our DOE leadership team and our two deputy managers and, uh, and site-wide manager that you talked about, Brian Vance. Um, there is no, this is our top priority on the Hanford site. Um, and that is, that is clear and evident in all of our meetings that we have on a regular basis. So I, I think that's what I wanted to convey on this chart. Yeah. Uh, I had a question on the, the cold commissioning, um, Tom, just, when you said that uh, like you'd use a mix of chemicals to, to simulate uh, that, that operations, would the chemical simulate the waste that would be treated? And then you'd actually have like the silicon material that gets melted to glass and then the chemicals would just be integrated just like waste would be in the future. Is that kind of what that, that means? Yeah, so we do, this in a, we do this in a stepwise fashion. So what we try to do is teach our operators in a environment that allows them to learn and it introduces hazards in a stepwise fashion. Okay. So we start with water. I mean, that's easy, right? There's no real sure. hazard. We then move into what we call a tuning simulant. And, and really there are two major hazards. We have um, what we call nitrous, the nitrous oxides in, or nitrogen oxides, um, NOx that you'll hear, right. um, which is our major chemical hazard on, in, in the facility. And it's built in the off gas system. Okay. So we start with tuning feeds. It doesn't create a NOx environment. So the yeah. commissioning techs, the team gets to learn without having that, that major chemical hazard present. We then go into our true coal commissioning simulant will, will produce that hazard um, okay. to ensure that our mitigation technologies, our downstream technologies in that, um, that off gas system are treating those chemical constituents that we expect to see in tank waste effectively and efficiently such that what we release out both the stack and out our discharge from a liquid effluent standpoint meet the regulatory requirements identified in our permit. And then finally, as I talked a little bit, we'll stress the system with our, our environmental performance demonstration testing by actually spiking chemicals into the system in addition to what we expect to see in tank waste to keep, create that envelope to say, yes, our system is operational in accordance with the permits, in accordance with the expectations um, so that, that layered effect to allow not only the plant to learn, because we're going to learn as much from this plant as the plants, as, as, as we're going to learn from the process. Um, uh, most people think that you just fire up a plant and it does what you told it to do originally. And I guarantee you, we are going to learn along the way. Um, it's going to get a say in how it wants to operate. And we're going to have to adjust as a team to how that operational and what, and what we do, because exactly what we've wrote in a procedure, I guarantee you, we're going to find dozens and even hundreds of times that that procedure says, no, 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 that's not how it's going to work. Um, and we're going to adapt to that. I and mean, we know that. So um, having that stepwise fashion as long as that learning approach in coal commissioning um, to truly get to when we go to that radioactive chemical constituent, that's truly the tank waste to have learned all that knowledge 
And now we know that those procedures, those people and the plant all are operating in conjunction to produce an environment that is both safe for our worker first and foremost, and ultimately our, 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 our sorry, for our human health, and, which is our worker and the environment as we move to the future. Hey, Bob. Thanks, that, that was a great description. So if we can slip on to slide 10, I'll talk a little bit more detail about what it means to go through melt or heat up because, uh, and, and I'll, I'm gonna start with the picture in this bottom center. Um, that is the melter. That is a, one of the two low activity waste melters that we have designed by Atkins, formerly Duratec, fabricated by Peterson down in Ogden, Utah. These are 300 tons a piece. These are not small uh, pieces of equipment. Um, currently two are installed and they're going through their system testing. We have two more that are being procured as spares. We have an assumption that it's a five year turn uh, change out. We do know that our uh, sisters and brothers across both the pond from a uh, from a England or a European side of the house as well as our DWPF counterparts have experienced longer life than that. But we wanna make sure that we're, we're ready for that as we go forward. But as you look to the process of actually heating up a melter, it's like, well, you can't just turn it on because there's no molten glass. You have to have molten glass in order to allow that current to pass from one electrode to the other electrode. The resistivity in the glass creates heat and therefore becomes self-generating once you have that molten glass. So what we do is a process called heat up. Um, that process takes about two months to reach 2100 degrees Fahrenheit. And for anybody that's trying to compare 2100 degree Fahrenheit, Think of the lava that came out of Mount Kilauea in Hawaii about a year ago or a year and a half ago when we had the major eruption. That is right at about 2100 degrees Fahrenheit. Wow. So we are creating molten glass, i.e. molten rock, because glass is very, very similar to a molten rock in, in, in some ways um, within our melter. And the way we do that is we have 18 ports that we actually install. Um, the best way to describe it is massive toaster coils. If you look in your toaster and you see the little heated elements, think about 18 of those that have about half inch diameter, about four feet long electrodes that heat up to glowing red. Wow. We have 18 of those that will stick into the top of each melter and we'll heat that melter up over a period of about 30 days uh, to condition it. That's just a starting point. We're conditioning the refractory inside each of these melters is a very intricate, and you can kind of see that in this cutaway um, in the red, greens, and blues that you see on the wall, and also that pink top cap, that's the refractory. That is the, the insulation that protects the metal on the outside from that molten glass. And the first step of that is really to dry it out and condition it. We then go through a process of adding um, what we call frit, and it's a mixed chemical, mixed glass component. Basically, it comes in what we call super sacks, about 300 pounds a piece. And we will slowly add about 40 uh, of those super sacks, of, uh, sorry, 140 of those super sacks, about 40,000 pounds of that frit material, which will ultimately melt within that 2100 degree environment. We'll get above that electrode and then we'll slowly start adding power to where we can then use the, what we call joule heating melting, joule heating uh, melters, use that joule heating, um, passing that electricity through that molten glass, and then we'll slowly turn down those preheaters and start pulling them out one at a time. So that melt up, that, well, a lot of people think it's just a flip of a switch. It's a flip of a two month switch. <laughs> um, and we assume that we're gonna learn during this first melt or heat up. So we do have some, uh, some margin built in or we put some margin in the system for risk realization as we've gone through this. Because again, Val and I have spent an extraordinary amount of time um, trying to analyze the risks as we go into this because the name of the game from here on out is culture and risk mitigation. Um, and I wanna point out one thing because I think it's a good comparison. What you see in that picture on the top in the little glass, what looks to be like little crushed glass is actually the frit material um, and a quarter next to it to show the size variation. And Glaval's got a jar, or Glass, I got a jar here on my back, <laughs> on my back shelf, um, is actually what will pour into the material or into those melters to heat them up and start that molten glass process. Out of curiosity, where does that come from? Like, where is the frit manufactured? And so that's a great question. And I'm going to let Val answer this one because it's actually okay. a new partnership or a new contract that we've put in oh. place uh, here locally. Oh, cool. 
Yeah, looking for my mute here. <laughs> um, sorry, I was looking for my, I, I have a bit on the, on the material that's coming is uh, with, um, excuse me, sorry. That's okay. um, my, Cause there's a couple companies I wanted to call out. Um, but the one that we're gonna be using the, um, that is helping us with the glass forming materials um, is Two Rivers Terminal out of Pasco. And oh, they've great. had some prior history out at Hanford on some other work um, uh, with the pump and treat projects, I believe. Um, but they're gonna be involved with helping to uh, supply uh, the material. So it's great to have a local contractor involved in that. Wow. And uh, yeah, so um, two, two Rivers Terminal out of Pasco. Awesome. The, I think we might have one more slide for Val, maybe. And I know Tom, you got a, a hard stop at 10. And, and so, you know, maybe in a couple of minutes, uh, you can jump off and we'll continue on with Val. But I think Val, you got the next slide, maybe? Uh, yes, if we can go to the next slide. And I, I have a hard stop as well. And so okay. I'm gonna um, cover this one quickly. And then maybe if there's some other questions to- yeah to go with on here, but really, I mean, we're invested in the community. I think that, um, you know, we've, we, I've talked about the skilled workforce uh, and our employees, it's the skilled craft and, and many of the, the uh, professional, um, you know, engineers and, and others are from the community. We live in the community and we, we support the community and, um, you know, we're part of it. So we're, it's in our best interest, one, not only that we're building a, a safe plant and operating it safely, but um, we're also very much uh, embedded here. And I think our team, the Bechtel team, uh, Amentum and together have just um, given some significant um, support to the community relative to um, some of the, you know, United Way, uh, we're, we're big supporters of Second Harvest and uh, their Bites to Go program. And also more recently, you see kind of a fun picture over there of the Special Olympics over the last two years supporting the Special Olympics with the polar plunge. And uh, this year it was sort of a virtual plunge and we were the top fundraisers in the state of Washington. And so uh, very much committed to the community and, um, you know, and, and um, looking forward to this next phase as we're getting ready to, to heat up the melters and start up the vid plant. Well, I, I have to jump in on this one too, Val, because you serve on our board of directors. Bechtel has been one of our longtime uh, members and, and you guys jointly sponsor our boardroom here in our uh, Tri-Cities Business Center, you know, for us, the regional chamber and, and visit Tri-Cities as well. So you guys are great supporters for the community. I can give firsthand confirmation for that. Um, since you guys both have hard stops, why don't we get into a couple questions? We just got a couple brief ones and then we'll wrap up a little bit early today. But I just want to thank you both for your time. This has been really interesting to me. I mean, it's just, I, it, someday I'd love to be able to go and see it firsthand, right? Because you think of this huge melter and the making glass and stuff and, and such great accomplishments, even with COVID, you and your teams have really done some amazing work. And, and we look forward, you know, from the community perspective and try to support you guys, you know, however we can. There was a, a question about the, the VIP plant. When it's in full operation, will it be able to? And I don't even know if this is, you know, allowed under Washington state law, but accept other sites waste. Is, is that part of it or really we're just treating waste here? That's the scope of this project, right? So the scope of this project is all local treatment. Uh, we, okay. we focus this project wholly on supporting the tank waste that exists here at Hanford. Um, and there's no intention to import waste from other places at, at, under any condition at this point in time for this facility. You bet. And then uh, the other question that we had was, what happens to the material after it's treated? Once once the uh, the aluminum container is filled with glass, it's cooled. Then uh, wh where does it go for long term storage? Yeah, so so I'll answer that one as well. Uh, long term storage, and I put this up early. If you looked at the DF loss, the DF law picture, it shows integrated disposal facility. That's a facility that's constructed here on site. It was constructed in okay. 2006. Um, it is the long term storage site. Glass is uh, in a in the most robust form. Um, from a storage perspective, and we will take those canisters that are created within the Lactity waste system over to the integrated disposal facility for ultimate disposal here on the Hanford site um, going forward. Yeah. Uh, oh, there we go. 
Yeah, so that's the truck down there that uh, shows that it's going to the uh, integrated disposal facility. Yeah, and that facility is only about a, I don't know, mile, mile and a half from the actual vitrification facility. So it's a relatively close uh, journey. Um, that is a that is a handoff point between uh, the operations of WTP and the CPC co contract that will actually operate the integrated disposal facility for us. Well, uh, Val and Tom, I just want to thank you guys both for your time. We'll wrap up to give you guys a few minutes back to get ready for your next meeting. But, um, you know, thank you both and your teams for your really commitment to the community. You know, not only, uh, you know, the support that you give, but I think really just the approach that you take to, to dealing with this waste and obviously putting safety first, you know, integrating your teams and, and kind of what you've explained to us today. But from what I know and what the perspective I have, I think you guys are doing a great job. And, and again, we just look forward to partnering and supporting uh, the whole Hanford mission and the one Hanford mission, especially as you move into operations and complete some of these milestones. So thank you both for your time this morning. It was a really great conversation and uh, we'll see you guys again soon. Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, we really appreciate the partnership as well and the support. Carl, we can't do it without that and the community and a lot of the people that are probably joined online today. And it just, it, it takes a lot of people and a lot of support to make this happen, but we're, we see it as a real privilege to be a part of it and, um, and just really appreciate the opportunity to share with you today. So. And I echo, I echo Val's uh, appreciation as an opportunity to be on here and share where we are today and where we're going. So thank you. You bet. Tom, maybe we'll see you up on uh, Bluewood this winter. Sounds good. Okay. Thank you both Have for your time. One. Have a great day. Right. Thank you.